Hello, welcome. It's great to see such a big crowd. Uh, I'm Rick Vandenberg. Uh, I'm a professor in the Grossman School of Business and the uh, UVM Janus Forum faculty director. And so welcome to the first Janus Forum event of this academic year. It's great to see uh, everybody here. Uh, let me tell you just a little bit about the Janus Forum before we get started. Uh, the Janus Forum is, is dedicated to the idea that we benefit from uh, constructive discussion about how to resolve important social issues. So our primary mission with the Janus Forum is to explore important problems and examining the efficacy of different solutions being centralized versus decentralized oftentimes, so often government solutions versus individual freedom. Uh, as a, as a potential solution as well. Uh, we encourage, I think one of the things that we really encourage with the Janus Forum is an is a open and constructive examination of alternatives while really avoiding rancorous and acrimonious discourse, which we often see on television. So that's one of our main objectives. Today we are really excited uh, to be holding this important event on gun control policy, and you will be hearing some differing views on policy as we go th as we work through the, the three speakers. I want to say just a few other things before we start. The Janus Forum is run by a, a group of faculty on campus across the entire UVM campus. I want to briefly thank them for their help. Uh, Caroline Beer from Political Science, Chris Kaliba from Community Development and Applied Economics, Don Loeb, who's our moderator today from Philosophy, Kurt Ventris from the Rubenstein School of Natural Resources, Art Wolf from Economics, Aaron Kinsvatter, and I didn't do that in alphabetical order, uh, from the College of Education and Social Services, so thank you guys. Uh, last year, we also started a partnership with the Lawrence Debate Union students, and that's been, we're very excited about that. We're getting uh, the students fully engaged uh, in the uh, Janus Forum, and they've been really helpful, and I want to thank especially uh, Charlotte Glisserman and Kaya Sittinger, who've been helping us with, with this event. Uh, there are several people in the audience that have made uh, it all possible for us to hold the Janus Forum event. First, we are incredibly grateful to the Pizza Galley family and to the Hilton family for their generosity. Uh, their support has made it possible now for the Janus Forum to have an enduring presence on the UVM campus, so thank you very much. I also want to thank the president's. I also want to thank the president's office as well as the UVM Foundation for their support. It's been helpful in in a in a variety of different ways, especially getting the the relationship with the Lawrence Debate Union students going. So that's been great. Uh, finally, an event like this doesn't occur without a lot of the behind the scenes help. So let me let me thank Linda Kruger, uh, Nick. Jin Gro and Jen O'Donnell from, I see Linda's head pointing out there, they're from the Gr Grossman School of Business and they've been helping a lot uh, with uh, all the setup. Really quickly, today is our first event of the year. We're gonna have another uh, event in the spring and I hope you'll keep your eyes out for that one. That one is going to be entitled, Yes or No, Should Speech Be Restricted on Campus? So a timely topic and uh, we have a couple of great speakers lined up so please keep your Keep, your, uh, keep that in mind as that event is announced. Before we begin, I have two final comments. First, uh, there is gonna be a reception afterwards, so I hope you'll join us. You'll have a chance to talk to the speakers, uh, so I hope you'll stick around for that. And second, I wanna introduce the moderator for today, which is Don Loeb. Don is a UVM professor in the philosophy department, and he's going to introduce the speakers, talk about the format. So thank you very much, Don. All right. Hi, and welcome. Uh, as you know, I'm Don Loeb. I'm from the philosophy department. I want to begin by introducing our distinguished panel, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about how today's event is going to be structured. Um, closest to me is Dr. Sanford Levinson, who is the W. St. John Garwood and W. St. John Garwood Jr. Centennial Chair in Law at the University of of Texas Law School, and also um, a professor of government at the University of Texas. He's written half a dozen books and about 400 articles of various sorts. Um, so this is 
Dr. Levinson. Next to him is Dr. Cassandra Kafasi, who is Assistant Professor of Health Policy and Management at John Hopkins University at the Bloomberg School of Public Health. She's also affiliated with the Johns Hopkins Center for Gun Policy Research. She writes about firearm policies, violence, epidemiology, and prevention, and other issues. So Dr. Kafasi. And finally, my colleague from the University of Colorado, Dr. Michael Humer at the University of Colorado at Boulder. He's written four books and dozens of academic papers. He's a very important person in the philosophy world. He writes about epistemology, ethics, and political philosophy. So here's Dr. Humer. So I'm going to start just by telling you a little bit about our format today, and then I'll get out of the way and let these people do their job. Um, each participant is going to be given 10 to 15 minutes to speak on a particular aspect of the debate. Um, the speakers have been very uh, lightly briefed on roughly what to expect from one another to say, so they may be responding to one another a little bit. Um, after all three of them have given their basic presentations, we'll give them each a chance to reply or ask questions. That'll be about five to ten minutes long. So that'll be follow-up, after which there'll be a question and answer period. When that's over, as Rick mentioned, uh, there'll be a reception lasting until 5.30, and you're all encouraged to stay for that. So, without further ado, uh, let me introduce Dr. Levinson, who is going to be speaking on legal issues concerning the Second Amendment to the United States Constitution. And if I can do this, I'll try to get his slides up. Thank you. I'm absolutely delighted to be here. Uh, very delighted to have the chance to reconnect with your president, Tom Sullivan, whom I had primarily known as a wonderful dean at a couple of law schools, and um, um, every institution that's ever been connected with, he has made better, and I have no doubt that's true here as well. So that's a delight to be here. Um, secondly, let me say, ap apropos of one of the comments in the introduction, that just as we could debate what the status of speech should be on campus, we could certainly debate what the status of guns should be on campus, because I come from a state um, in which uh, concealed carry on the University of Texas campus is a legal right, courtesy of the Texas state legislature. Uh, most of the faculty, and I will say I'm included in that, don't think this is a great idea, though quite frankly, I think it's more emblematic of the culture war aspect of the firearms debate than it is, uh, in my case, the generator of fear that some disgruntled student might actually shoot me because of what I have to say. Uh, but one of the things this illustrates is that in most states, and I suspect Vermont is one of those states as well, the national constitution and the Second Amendment, what the Supreme Court says, really isn't all that important. Uh, almost all of the states have right to bear arms provisions in their state constitutions. One of the pathologies of legal education, quite frankly, and of much other education, is that people tend to know of one and only one constitution, that is the U.S. Constitution. In fact, there are 50 state constitutions. They're really interesting and really important. And if you're interested in the issue of firearms and firearms policy, you're very well advised to find out what your state constitution says and what your state legislature says. It is not that the Texas Constitution uh, on its own protects students bringing firearms onto the UT campus. It is that the Texas legislature passed that legislation. And there's no serious argument that that legislation is unconstitutional under the US Constitution, though a couple of my colleagues tried to argue that it violated their academic freedom rights under the First Amendment. But uh, I'm here primarily, especially in 12, 15 minutes, to present a perspective, and I emphasize a rather than the, legal perspective on one aspect of the legal argument, which is, in fact, the national constitutional argument linked to the Second Amendment. Uh, if I get an obituary, uh, it will be for an article that I wrote and was published in the AOR Journal in 1989, 
called the embarrassing Second Amendment. Uh, who was embarrassed by it? The answer quickly was political liberals, who most of whom then, fewer today, but it's still probably fair to say, most of whom today uh, wish to control guns, often for very, very good reasons, um, and really did not want to be informed of or spend any time talking about the Second Amendment. And the Second Amendment basically had been dismissed as close to a nullity. Uh, it was really viewed as meaning that the states can do whatever they want with regard to the control of firearms, and that was that. Uh, Justice Berger once, Chief Justice Berger once memorably said in the pages of Parade magazine that the arguments offered by the NRA were simply a fraud on the American people. Uh, well, one thrust of that Yale article is that that just wasn't right in terms of being faithful to the history or even the meaning of the Second Amendment, and it really did have to be confronted. But let me also suggest that political conservatives are often embarrassed by the reason I give for the existence of the Second Amendment in the Constitution. I'll say that the gestation of that article was an invitation at Williams College in um, uh, 1989 uh, on the occasion of the bicentennial of the Bill of Rights. Um, I had already thought enough about the First Amendment, frankly. Uh, I wasn't going to be surprised by any new thoughts I might have about the First Amendment. I had never really thought that much about the Second Amendment. There it was. And so I said, you know, this will be an occasion to ask, what in the world is the Second Amendment doing in the Constitution? And so I gave a paper at Williams, and then it ended up in the Yale uh, Law Journal. And the answer I gave, roughly and briefly, is that the Second Amendment is about protecting the right of a free people to have firearms in order to overthrow an oppressive state. That is what sometimes might embarrass political conservatives, because political conservatives like to talk about self-defense, where the self-defense is against the criminal who is coming in to rob your home, or you know, a 7-Eleven. I don't think that's a trivial issue. I think that one can read the Constitution to protect a right of self-defense, but quite frankly, I think the Second Amendment has almost nothing to do with that reading of the Constitution. I think you get there through the 14th Amendment or the 9th Amendment, um, and although I am one of the actually approves of the outcome in a very controversial 2008 Supreme Court case, uh, the Heller decision, uh, which said that the Second Amendment did prohibit the District of Columbia basically from prohibiting the private possession of handguns. I really, really do not like Justice Scalia's majority opinion because, frankly, I think he offers a honest view of the history of the Second Amendment. Uh, he insisted on being an originalist. He was opposed to the idea of a living constitution, so therefore he had to shoehorn a theory of defense into late 18th century American political thought, and I think, frankly, he did a terrible, terrible job. He could have done a far better job had he said absolutely truthfully that by 1857 you had a consensus ranging from Charles Sumner, the great abolitionist senator from Massachusetts, to Roger Brooke Tawney, the author of Dred Scott, that one of the things you got from being a citizen of the United States was a right to bear arms to protect yourself. There was no discussion in Dred Scott, there was no discussion uh, in Sumner's great bleeding Kansas speech about service in the militia or rising up and against oppressive state. And so you really do have important developments in American thought, but Scalia was constricted by his version of an originalist view of the Constitution, so we get a reading of the Second Amendment that I think is insupportable, but as I've already suggested, I can give you a reading 
of other parts of the Constitution that certainly do protect an individual's right uh, to bear arms. But to f talk for just one more moment about what the Second Amendment is doing in the Constitution, which is what provoked my Williams talk that then generated the Yale Law Journal article, um, I don't think you ought to forget the fact that we're talking about 13 years after a violent uprising against what was thought, rightly or not, to be the tyranny led by King George III. These were people who were intimately aware of the possibility of an aroused populace taking up arms to overthrow an oppressive uh, state or an oppressive government. There were a lot of people who, for somewhat understandable reasons, were suspicious of this brand new consolidationist constitution uh, that we'll be celebrating, or some people will be celebrating uh, next Sunday or Monday, and who thought that the constitution was basically a plot by urban elites to take over power and institute their own oppression, and that it would be a good idea if ordinary American citizens knew that they could have arms for the purpose of collectively rising up and overthrowing an oppressive state. In the context of late 18th century, or even more to the point, 17th century uh, Anglo-American thought, that makes perfectly good sense. Uh, Rightly or wrongly, we generally don't talk that way these days, whether you're liberal or conservative. If you're very far left or very far right, you might find yourself talking that way these days. But unless you're very far on the spectrum, uh, taking up arms to overthrow the government is not kind of common currency. So instead, the Supreme Court focuses on an individual right of self-defense against an isolated criminal, and as I've already suggested, you can get there quite easily through looking at other parts of the Constitution besides the Second Amendment. I don't think the Second Amendment is very helpful. Uh, let me conclude my remarks, and I, I really am looking forward to the conversation afterward and any questions you might have. Uh, a problem with Justice Scalia's opinion, quite independent of the fact uh, that from my perspective, it's something of a travesty of historical analysis. Um, he says there is a really fundamental individual right to keep and bear arms to protect yourself against those who threaten you, which is not at all a dumb argument. But then, largely, I think, in order to get the fifth vote of Justice Kennedy, he reassures the readers that every existing federal regulation of firearms is perfectly all right without a scintilla of explanation. Well, let me tell you what I think is the most interesting federal regulation of firearms. It's the regulation that, presents, that prevents felons from possessing firearms. If, when you think of a felon, you think of somebody convicted of a violent crime. It's fairly easy to figure out why you would not want somebody who had murdered or you know, stuck up a 7-Eleven to possess firearms. If, on the other hand, when you think of a felon, you think of Martha Stewart, who was convicted and went to jail for giving a false statement to an FBI agent then it's really pretty hard to figure out if you take a theory of self-defense at all seriously, why she should be forced to give up her right to protect herself with a firearm in her no doubt lavishly appointed home um, against somebody who might be breaking in. Um, so there are implications of any of the arguments you might present with regard to the basis of a right to keep and bear arms. If you adopt what I think was the late 18th century view that it's really a theory of an aroused community 
um, uh, rising up in rebellion against oppressive government, that leads to one set of questions. I won't try to answer them now, but I'm always asked, well, what about atomic weapons? Or what about um, uh, F-35s or whatever? I have answers to that if you're interested. If, on the other hand, you focus on the individual right of self-defense, then you really ought to address the Martha Stewart problem or the millions and millions of Americans who have been convicted and incarcerated for nonviolent crimes and who as a result of their enjoying the status or being, or being hindered by the status of being a convicted felon lose the right under federal law to possess firearms. Okay, let's thank our speaker. Next, um, Dr. Cassandra Kafasi will be offering a public health perspective on violence, on the role of firearms, and on policies that effectively reduce homicide and suicide. Uh, I guess it's this. I'm going to stand up. Just, I'm, I'm going to try not to pace too far, but I may sashay a little bit that way, but I'll try to keep myself close. So I'm an injury epidemiologist. I study the impact of different policies on different injury outcomes. And with the Center for Gun Policy and Research, spend a lot of time focusing on the impact of firearm policies on homicide and suicide. So what does the public health perspective sort of bring to this, this discussion. So for those of you not familiar, um, when we think about deaths, we focus on sort of all deaths. We don't, we don't narrow ourselves down into one particular outcome. We look at homicide, suicide, um, unintentional deaths for all victims. Importantly, um, you can see down on the left there what we call the epidemiologic triangle. It's how we think about the spread of disease or the spread of violence, which we often think of as having a very contagious aspect in the um, retaliatory violence that can happen that's okay. Can you guys hear me okay? Okay. All right. I'll try to stay a little closer. Um, and so we think about the, the vector in this, in the instance of gun policy or gun violence, the vector would be the firearm. We look at how we can design and implement and evaluate different interventions or policies that may have a positive or negative effect. We like to focus on preventing something rather than punishing something after the fact because, again, with the case of homicide, if you can prevent a homicide, you can hopefully break the chain of violence and prevent any subsequent retaliatory violence that would happen as a result of that homicide. And we also like to think about the three E's. So we have education. Can you change behavior in the population that you're trying to affect? Are there environmental changes that you can make to make the, you know, it, the world that we're living in safer. So think about airbags in cars and breakaway signs that you know, if you run into a sign in your car, it'll break away and, and cause less damage. And then when all else fails, enforcement. So there are policies or laws that can be implemented that can help reduce homicide. So I'm, I'm, a, I'm an epidemiologist. I like to think about data. So. Uh, on average, every day in the United States, 100 people die from a firearm-related death. 60% of those are the result of suicide. So if you pay attention to the media, you hear about homicide all the time, mass shootings, you may not think about the fact that twice as many people die from self-directed firearm harm as are killed by firearms. I'm going to focus on the lighter shaded um, pie today. I could spend lots more hours boring you guys about the other parts of the pie, but we'll focus on, on the, the homicide pie. So in 2015, which is the last year that we have complete vital statistics data, unfortunately, um, there were almost 13,000 firearm homicides, which represented 73% of all homicides committed in the U.S. <clears throat> but, um, and, and when you look at um, the homicide rates in the U.S., you see that when you look at firearm versus non-firearm homicide, there are some pretty significant differences. Our non-firearm homicide rate, which is the light gray line on the bottom, 
is basically equivalent to other economically uh, equivalent countries. What sets us apart is our rate of firearm homicide. And if you're staring at this graph and wondering what that blip is right there, that's September 11th. So that those were counted as non-firearm homicides when the planes crashed into the World Trade Center. <coughs> So when we think about firearm homicide, it's really important to keep in mind that the, the distribution of homicide is not equivalent across the population. Homicide is a fairly uniquely urban problem, whereas suicide tends to be a very rural problem. The vast majority of firearm homicides are occurring in urban areas, and there's disproportionate victimization. So here you can see the firearm homicide rate broken down by black versus white population in 2015. You can see the huge spike that happens in the rate of firearm victimization in the early teen years uh, for young black men. Black Americans are about 14% of the US population, but account for 50% of homicide victimization. So there's clearly some, some disparate um, effects being felt. And when you add gender into the mix, it becomes even greater. So let, take a look at the uh, scale here. And when you separate out for black men specifically, you see more than 90 per 100,000 young black men um, are being killed each year uh, in the US. <clears throat> it's the leading cause of death. Homicide is a leading cause of death for young black men age 15 to 34. And when you look at the rate of, of um, the crude rate of gun, gun homicide in this group, it's 10 times higher than their white male counterparts. So when we think about firearm homicide, um, it's important to think about the specific firearm being used. So, you know, we, have, we have long guns, shotguns, and rifles, and then we have um, more concealable weapons like handguns. So in 2015, for the guns that were known, the type of gun that was known, about 90% of them were handguns. Now, we only knew about 56% of them for a variety of reasons. Guns aren't recovered or left at the crime scene. The person is never arrested, and so they never find the gun. The type of bullet that was used could be from a rifle or a handgun, depending on the caliber, and so it can be challenging to identify the specific type of firearm used. But so for the most part, when states have laws that um, identify quote unquote regulated firearms, they're generally talking about handguns, although some states also have bans on large capacity magazines and assault weapons that would fall into that regulated category. But for the most part, they're often talking about um, handguns. So I just wanna add a little bit more, Dr. Levinson did a great job, far more aptly than I could, talking about the Second Amendment. But I want to add in a few other key policy events that I think have affected our ability to do research and design interventions to um, disrupt the flow of guns to prohibited persons and uh, reduce violence. So we have the Second Amendment, and then you know there are some other things happening. But in general, we see um, sort of the first big legal change in 1968, which was the Gun Control Act, which is the first sort of framework for thinking about identifying a group of individuals with certain characteristics that we want to prohibit gun ownership for. <clears throat> and then in um, 1986, there's the Firearm Owners Protection Act. It did um, a few things. It uh, made it easier to sell guns without a license, so you could, you could sell guns more easily without being a federally licensed firearm de dealer. And it also um, addressed what Dr. Levinson pointed out as a problem, is it allowed states to decide if they wanted to restore felons' gun rights. But then there's still the issue of, if you restore it at the state level, is that going to be recognized um, federally, which I'm sure he can answer far better than I can. In 1994, the Brady Law passed, which mandated that Guns purchased from federally licensed firearm dealers were subject to background checks, and you have the national instant check system developed as a result. In the late 1990s, ATF had gathered what we call crime gun trace data. So they, 
have guns recovered in crime, they trace them back to the, um, the gun dealer of record and the original purchaser and try to link that to the possessor. And they found that about 1% of all gun dealers in the United States were responsible for selling more than half of all the guns that were recovered in crime. So a very small group of gun dealers were almost single-handedly, because you know we have about 88,000 federally licensed firearm dealers, so 1% of them were diverting more than half of the guns into the criminal market. So there were lawsuits against these dealers with the sole purpose of trying to change their sales practices. How could they do things differently to better identify straw purchasers, you know, conduct background checks to make sure people weren't prohibited? Um, but then in 2003, uh, members of Congress took um, offense to that and passed um, TIARD amendments. They're named for the, for the individual. Um, which made it against the law to release this crime gun trace data. It couldn't be used in litigation or licensing decisions. Um, they, uh, yeah, so, so it made it more difficult then to say, these dealers are not following the law, let's, let's punish them. You couldn't use that data anymore um, to take away individuals that we know are diverting guns to criminals, take away their license. Um, the Protectful, uh, Protection of Lawful Commerce and Arms Act took that a step further in 2005 and gave gun sellers immunity from litigation, except in very, very specific cases um, where you're allowed to um, sue a, sell a gun seller. And then, as Dr. Levinson already discussed, the, the Heller case in 2008 struck down D.C.'s handgun ban. The language in there gave an individual a right to own guns for self-defense. Um, but again, affirmed the government's role to keep guns away from dangerous or high-risk individuals. So I'm not going to go through, through this, but I just want to um, talk briefly about the fact that the federal law sets the floor for gun policy. So you can, states can decide to have stronger policies, have more prohibitions for a variety of things, but no state can have anything less than what is set um, at the federal level. So 19 states and the District of Columbia regulate private sales, so you have to undergo a background check for a private sales transfer. Every state, this applies to handguns. A few other states, does it also apply um, to long guns? <clears throat> and then 11 states have implemented a mechanism to ensure compliance with comprehensive background checks called a permit to purchase, and I'm gonna talk more about that um, in a couple of minutes, but I just want you to see here uh, so some of the different standards. And, and so then what does this mean for firearm homicide? <clears throat> so uh, the federal government prohibits someone convicted of a domestic violence misdemeanor from owning a, guns, owning a gun, but several states have extended that prohibition to uh, people that are subject to domestic violence restraining orders. We see reductions in intimate partner homicide in these states, pretty significant reductions in some states. Uh, when, you, when states prohibit gun ownership for all violent misdemeanors, not just domestic, domestic violence misdemeanors, you see reductions in commission of future crime. And we have some new research we're conducting right now that also shows reductions in intimate partner homicide when you uh, prohibit based on all violent misdemeanors because there may be some connection between domestic violence in the home and violent misdemeanors outside of the home. And then uh, I'm going to spend uh, the remainder of my time talking about permit to purchase laws, which are among the most, if not the most effective policy of reducing both firearm homicide and firearm suicide. So the vast majority of states that have these policies have had them in place for decades, and it makes it very hard to evaluate because we don't have good data going back far enough. We had the opportunity to do a couple of very nice natural experiments when in Connecticut in 1995, they decided to pass a permit to purchase licensing system. You had to get a background check for all handgun sales. You applied to law enforcement to get this permit. It was good for five years. They kept track of you, and if you became prohibited at any time, they revoked your permit. Missouri had a law in place since the 1920s and decided in 2007 to repeal the law to make it easier for law-abiding citizens to purchase guns, much like 
the Connecticut law, you had to apply in person, undergo a background check. Um, these were only good for 30 days, however. So we did, I'm not gonna talk about it now because I only have a few minutes left, um, but we did what we call synthetic control modeling. If you're interested in knowing what that is, I'd be happy to talk to you about it in the questions or afterwards. But we generated um, estimates of what happened in what would have happened in Connecticut and Missouri had their laws not changed and compared it to what actually happened. You can see in Connecticut, after they passed their law, 24% reduction in firearm homicide and a 15% reduction in firearm suicide. The opposite occurred in Missouri with a 16% increase in both homicide and suicide by firearm when they repealed their law. But we didn't want to just look at distal outcomes because sometimes the effect of a policy can take a while um, to be felt. And so we looked at, a, at two more uh, upstream uh, indicators. So in order for guns to be used by criminals, you know, who are uh, obtaining them illegally, they have to enter the market somehow, right? They they're not growing on trees. They have to be diverted into the illegal market somehow. And so there are two measures that we look at. One is within a state, what proportion of guns recovered in crime came from that state originally. So the black line is the, um, the guns that were coming from Missouri and recovered in crime in Missouri. And the gray line are guns coming from other states. And you can see that in, you know, between 2007 and 2008, where prior to that, the lines had been basically parallel, because this is a very, very stable measure, they started to separate, and more guns that were recovered in crime in Missouri came from Missouri, indicating to us that the local supply of crime guns became, um, it, it, was, uh, it was easier to get crime guns in Missouri, and so you didn't have to get guns from other states. The other uh, measure that we looked at is time to crime. So if a gun is purchased and then recovered within one year of time to crime, that's a really strong indicator. The ATF says that that gun was purchased for criminal intent. And you can see prior to 2008, low and fairly stable percent of guns that were being recovered with very short time to crime that increased dramatically after the law was repealed. Again, indicating to us it was easier to get guns to be used in crime within Missouri. You no longer had to risk interstate gun trafficking charges. So this is um, my last slide. I just wanna, I've been sort of talking kind of negatively about what happened in Missouri, but I wanna end on a positive note. So there are things that we know work to reduce gun violence, permit to purchase being one of them. And as Dr. Levinson pointed out, we are not in a country where we are going to prohibit gun ownership. It's unconstitutional and it's politically infeasible, but we can work within the confines of our constitution and other laws to make people safer. But we need to engage people in the conversation. We need to be having open dialogue with people that are enforcing the laws, people that have influence in the community. We need to cultivate moderate gun owners, people who own guns and like the vast majority of gun owners in the country support reasonable regulations like a background check for private sales. We need to shift away from you're either for or against guns. That's not gonna get us anywhere. It hasn't gotten us anywhere anytime recently. And think more on safety. What can we do to make, what can we agree upon to make our country safer, to reduce access by dangerous or high-risk individuals and reduce homicide? And, that, and that's the key. It's not prohibiting gun access to everyone. It's not prohibiting gun access to law-abiding citizens. If you follow the rules of the land, you should be able to own guns. But there are high-risk individuals that have already committed crime, and those are the individuals that we need to focus on um, if we're gonna be successful in reducing gun violence. Thanks, um, Dr. Kofasi. Uh, now, Dr. Michael Humer, our philosopher, will speak on the right to own a gun as, uh, for self-defense and the relevance of societal consequences of gun ownership vis-a-vis uh, -vis the right to self-defense. So take it away. Let's see. 
I have a little slideshow that I'm going to try to play. wondering why it's not showing up on my screen. Sorry. It's gone. Right, let's just go to file and see if it's in the recently opened items. Okay. Okay, so um, uh, so I'm going to talk about um, issues about rights, and if you have a right to own a gun, uh, the picture in the top there is uh, trying to show you how cute gun ownership can be. Okay, uh, I have some thought experiments that I want you to just think about. Uh, so here's the first example. Um, this is a hypothetical example, and uh, it's sort of for moral philosophy purposes. So there's a case in which um, there are three people. Call them the killer, the victim, and the accomplice. The killer breaks into the victim's house and uh, intending to kill the victim. The accomplice, for some reason, holds the victim down and prevents the victim from getting away while the killer stabs the victim to death. And now the question is, so the killer has committed murder, which is you know, the most serious or close to the most serious crime you can commit. And uh, what about the accomplice? And I want you to focus on that. Um, the accomplice did something very wrong, right? Uh, was it as wrong as the murder? Well, it wasn't worse than the murder, but it wasn't a lot better than the murder, right? It was about as wrong as the murder, right? Maybe only slightly less bad, right? Okay, second example is uh, similar to that, except in this case, the victim has a gun, which the victim would use to defend himself if he were able, except that the accomplice comes in and grabs the gun and takes it away before the victim is able to use it to defend himself. Uh, and by the way, the accomplice does this knowing what the result will be. So then the killer is able to kill the victim. And now what I want you to think is, so that's really relevantly similar to the first example. The accomplice's action was very wrong in the first example. And in the second example, it's morally relevantly the same. Uh, again, the accomplice is allowing the killer to commit the crime. OK, um, now in moral philosophy, there's a famous distinction between harming and allowing harm. It's commonly thought that it is much worse to harm a person than it is to merely allow a harm to occur or merely fail to prevent a harm. OK, this is, here, this is a third category of action, preventing someone from preventing the harm. And what these examples show is that preventing the prevention of a harm goes along with harming. It's not like allowing harm. Right? That is, if you're preventing somebody from stopping a harm from occurring, then that's morally comparable to committing the harm yourself. It's not like just standing by and failing to prevent it. OK, uh, here's a third example. There's a citizen who wants to own a gun for self-defense, and the government comes and stops them from doing that, right? Either stops them from getting the gun or takes the gun away from them after they got it. And as a result, uh, a crime is committed against the citizen. What do we think of the government's action? And now what I want you to think is um, that's kind of comparable to the previous two examples. Uh, these are, again, cases where somebody prevented the prevention of a harm. Uh, it's not like the government merely allowed a harm to occur, right? Uh, and of course, I use the term accomplice in the first two examples deliberately, <laughs> right? So my suggestion is the government then becomes like an accomplice to crime. So this leads to my central argument for what's wrong with, uh, well, what's wrong with most kinds of gun control laws. Uh, and of course, I'm painting with a broad brush here, but roughly speaking, um, laws that prevent people who have a right to defend themselves from doing so. Um, so these laws coercively prevent some individuals from defending themselves against crimes. And coercively preventing someone from defending themselves against a crime is very seriously wrong. 
Specifically, it's comparable to committing the crime yourself. And that's what was shown by the hypothetical examples on the previous page. So gun control laws are seriously wrong. That is, they're morally comparable to the state itself committing multiple crimes, like committing multiple murders, rapes, armed robberies, and so on. Uh, and that is, uh, you know, assuming there are some individuals who would defend themselves with a firearm if they were able, and the government prevents some people from doing that um, through coercive interventions. Okay. Um, now, I want to want to talk about an issue about kind of rights considerations versus consequentialist arguments. So, uh, in moral philosophy, there's kind of a debate about, well, when, if ever, it's permissible to override somebody's rights in order to produce better consequences. Uh, consequentialist arguments are arguments that appeal to what produces better consequences overall. Uh, so, in the moral philosophy point I want to make here is uh, we don't generally consider it okay to violate somebody's rights to provide a greater benefit for somebody else. Right, so this is a famous example. Uh, there's, there's been a crime that caused a lot of public outrage in a particular town, and uh, the sheriff of the town believes that unless someone is punished for this crime, there are going to be riots during which uh, many innocent people are going to be harmed unjustly. Uh, the sheriff, unfortunately, cannot find the person who was actually responsible for the crime, but what he could do is he could frame an innocent person and cause that person to be punished for the crime and thereby forestall the riots. Okay, by the way, this is not a totally unrealistic example. Uh, if you recall the, um, uh, sorry, I've, I've forgotten the name, uh, the trial in Los Angeles where the police officers were acquitted for beating this guy, um, who was yeah, the Rodney King trial, and then there were huge riots during which multiple people were injured. Uh, now, the only difference is in that case they were guilty, but you know, pretend that they were innocent. <laughs> and uh, it could still be that you could have a reason for convicting them to prevent the riots, right? Uh, as long as they're believed to be guilty. Uh, should you convict the innocent person? I, I assume your answer is no. Wait, should I take a survey? Okay, brief survey. How many say convict the innocent person? Come on, it's gonna be, yeah, see, there's always a couple people, right? Okay, how many say don't convict the innocent person? Okay, okay, now, uh, you know, that's the vast majority response in any audience. Uh, that doesn't prove that it's right, but, you know, nevertheless, uh, I think you should not, not convict the innocent person. But wait, why? Because if you don't, then, like, a larger number of innocent people are going to suffer an injustice, right? Uh, but you, s you still can't do that because of the nature of rights, right? That is, your having a right means we can't violate it even if that would protect like two or three other people from a similar harm. Okay, now I'm not saying that this is absolute. So suppose that somehow uh, killing one innocent person will prevent a world war, you know, which would kill millions of people. Uh, then I guess you convict the, you kill the innocent person, okay? But it's got to be fairly extreme, I think. All right, so the, the lesson of this is um, don't violate somebody's rights to prevent a comparable harm to others, but maybe you could violate somebody's rights to prevent a vastly greater harm to others. Okay, those are the lessons I just said. Uh, so the conclusion relevant to gun control is it looks to me like gun control laws are wrong even if they prevent a greater but comparable harm to other people, right? So that is... Um, if we, if we tried to ban handguns, uh, some people would be helped because they wouldn't be shot by a handgun wrongly, but some people would be harmed because they wouldn't be able to defend themselves with a handgun. Uh, and it's, it's comparable to saying to the second group of people, well, we're going to violate your rights. That is, the government will be doing something comparable to committing crimes against them in order to produce this benefit for this other group of people. And we don't generally accept that sort of thing. Um, you know, it would have to be that there is uh, some kind of vastly greater disaster that would happen without the laws. Okay, uh, now uh, what exactly, what are um, the costs and benefits of gun ownership? Uh, there's a lot of debate about this, so it can't really be resolved. Um, there are widely varying estimates of how frequently guns are used for self-defense purposes. 
Uh, the lowest that you can find is around 55,000 per year in the United States. 55,000 times per year somebody uses a gun for self-defense. The highest estimate you can find is 4.7 million per year. I don't know why the estimates vary so drastically. Um, I guess the conclusion I would say is, well, there's a lot of self-defense used. It's not a trivial thing. And it's really hard to claim that the amount of crime prevented is vastly greater uh, you know, you know, by taking away guns than the amount of crime that the guns themselves prevent. Uh, there's a, a, a lot of literature about concealed weapons laws and uh, what effect they have on crime. Uh, some say that, that they decrease crime, sorry, that allowing concealed carry of weapons decreases crime. This is the result of John Lott's famous study, uh, but that's been disputed by others. There was a National Research Council study that uh, kind of looked at the evidence on both sides and concluded that you can't really draw a clear conclusion. But if you're not sure whether a law produces greater benefits than harms, but it violates people's rights, then don't do it. Right, so people should be allowed to carry concealed weapons. Uh, you know, as long as we're not sure that allowing them to carry concealed weapons causes vastly greater harms. Okay, and uh, what else? Okay, uh, those are just some sources that I consult in case anybody wants to look at it. But you're probably not going to copy that down now. But uh, you know, if anybody emails me later, I'll send them that. Okay, that's all. Okay, so what's going to happen now is um, we're going to start a Q&A session. Um, there will be people walking around with microphones. Sorry? Oh, sorry, we're going to give them uh, five or ten minutes to respond each. Yep. Dr. Um, Levinson, would you like to re uh, talk for five or ten minutes? I guess I'd begin by evoking my favorite philosopher, political theorist, who's Goldilocks, where, because I think over and over again, we are torn between what is clearly the too hot bowl of porridge or the too cold bowl of porridge and looking for the just right one. Um, if you look at public opinion data, putting to one side the question of its relevance, and you know, reasonable people can disagree about the relevance of polling data, but if you look at polling data, you discover that a hefty majority of the public agree both that there is an individual right to bear arms and that reasonable controls are legitimate. So that the debate for most people is what the Goldilocks point is. Now, in terms of understanding contemporary American politics, you have to understand that particularly single issue political groups aren't interested in Goldilocks points. That's not the way they raise their money. It's not the way they mobilize support. And so famously or infamously, the National Rifle Association tends to argue that any and all controls uh, either violate rights or don't work or are simply emanations of a tyrannical government. Relatively few gun control groups will admit to a desire simply to prohibit guns, but I think it's fair to say that rightly or wrongly, many of those people within what, for lack of a better term, could be called the, the pro-gun community are suspicious of the sincerity or the honesty of gun control groups they think that it's, you know, the camel's nose that politically, as was suggested, it's not going to fly to say that what I really support is legislation simply prohibiting uh, gun ownership. And it's difficult to persuade people on the other side that you really mean it, that you think that there is a right of individual self-defense and therefore a right of at least some gun ownership, but there isn't a right to own machine guns, or there isn't a right to take your gun into a fraternity party, and I use the sexist term advisedly, um, or into a bar. Um, Justice Scalia had no trouble saying that it was perfectly legitimate to bar bringing firearms into federal courts, 
I wonder why he thought that was legitimate. Um, and so I think that where one can have a civil argument is what our different notions of Goldilocks points are. You know, something like, I forget the particular data point, 91%, 89% after Sandy Hook agreed uh, that some sort of um, um, purchase requirement would be legitimate. That is, you're not prohibited from purchasing, but there has to be some assurance, at the very least, that you haven't committed a violent felony, um, and then for some, that you haven't committed any felony at all, and that's where I actually you know, we'll flip over to being more a partisan of gun rights than not. The one problem I have with rights arguments, um, it's not that I particularly want to say, no, the utilitarians and the consequentials have it right, and rights arguments are, you know, we ought to put off the table. I'm sympathetic to many rights arguments, but I think that, as was illustrated, that every partisan of rights, Ronald Dworkin, who famously titled one of his books, Taking Rights Seriously, had an exception for potentially catastrophic situations. Even Robert Nozick, who is in some ways the father of modern philosophical libertarianism, had an exception for the world coming to an end. And so at that point, we start slicing the salami and say, okay, is it enough if 100,000 people are threatened? Most people, I think, would say, you know, 100,000, that's a pretty good reason to violate some individual's right. What if it's 10,000? What if it's only 10? And at some point, unless you're a thoroughgoing utilitarian of a kind that actually is relatively rarely found, because I think all of us are mixtures of Kantians and Benthamites, depending on how we present the problem. Um, at some point, we try to figure out, okay, the numbers really do matter, but at what point do we say, I would honor the individual right, even at the risk that five innocent people will die but I'm not going to honor the individual right where there's a threat of 500 people. And then that brings in the empirical arguments. And I, I really enjoyed the second presentation. Empirical arguments are important, but it's also the case, I mean, you, you would have read the John Locke's article. It's a very, very well-known article. It's a very well-known discredited article, except for those people who continue to cite it. <laughs> and, uh, but in all seriousness, um, empirical research is hard to do, especially if you talk about the gold standard of double-blind experiments in very carefully matched states. Uh, you, you know, you really have to be grateful for Missouri when Missouri comes along or when Connecticut comes along. <laughs> right. And then, you know, you try to engage in inferences, but other very good social scientists can point out that there are problems in the inferential analysis, but kind of that's all we have. And it does seem to me that it's really important to remember that most Americans believe, first of all, that there is a right to the individual possession of firearms for some purpose or another, and, that, and that's their Kantian side, if you will, and that most Americans believe that those rights can be impaired for good public serving reasons, that's the utilitarian side of how most of us who don't do philosophy for a living kind of make our way through the world. Uh, so I just want to make a couple of points. So to, to build on what Dr. Levinson said about the discredited John Law article, one of the reasons that was discredited is because when other researchers got his, his data set, it was found to be riddled with not just improperly coded laws, but incorrect data, and no one else could ever replicate exactly what he found in terms of more guns and less crime. 
Um, in fact, the most recent and probably most rigorous evaluation of right to carry laws, uh, which are sort of the most permissive form of concealed carry laws, show an 18% increase in violent crime in states that have these laws, and the effect increases the longer a state has had that law. So more violent crime is occurring when these, when these states have permissive laws, and the longer they're in place, you know, the more crime is occurring. The other point I wanted to make uh, was about self-defensive gun use. Um, Dr. Humer had, had mentioned that there were sort of wide-ranging estimates about, you know, is it, is it a, you know, 10,000, a few tens of thousands? Is it a few million self-defensive gun uses every year? And the reason we have such wide um, estimates is because that's what they are, they're estimates. It's based on survey data or, you know, you, you survey a few people and try to extrapolate up or you have, um, you know, people sort of self-reporting that they use guns in crime. Um, the sort of most famous researcher that has studied self-defensive gun use, Gary Kleck, um, he, he interviewed individuals and had them describe their self-defensive gun use. And when lawyers and judges actually reviewed the narratives, when they described their self-defensive gun use, they actually became the aggressor when they pulled their gun out. There was, they were not in immediate peril of death or severe injury, and they felt the need to pull their gun out, and then they actually could have been prosecuted for aggravated assault with a firearm when they pulled their gun out. Um, when, when you look at the National Crime Victimization Survey, which is sort of the, the <clears throat> most comprehensive survey that we have of violent crime victimization, using a gun in self-defense of a crime in no way affects the outcome uh, of whether you'll be injured. Um, it's, it's no more effective than running away and hiding. It's no more effective than throwing something at the person. It's no more effective than trying to hit them with some kind of blunt object. So there, there certainly is, as I said, a, a right to own guns for self-defense, and I'm not saying that no one ever uses a gun for self-defense and they don't ever use it effectively, but it's far less common than people think it is, uh, and it's not always as effective as we would like to think it is uh, compared to other forms of self-defense. Okay. Um... Now, I guess, uh, I guess at the Janus Forum, I'm supposed to uh, be a moderate or something like that, but I confess to being an extremist. So, uh, I mean, I'll say one thing about, um, you know, like one aspect of my extremism. Um, so, uh, frequently people, people say, as an example of a reasonable gun control measure, everyone is going to agree with, um, you know, you can't have machine guns, right? I mean, you totally agree with that humor, right? <laughs> or, you know, you, you agree that people shouldn't be able to have out of these, you know, Barrett 50 caliber, right, which are, you know, huge. Uh, actually, no, I don't agree. So, and and the reason I'm bringing this up is, uh, you know, apropos of uh, Levinson's talk to begin with, um, I, I agree with the original justification for the Second Amendment, that is, uh, people have to be in a position to defend themselves from the state. And actually, I think that's, a, very serious and realistic threat, right? Uh, just looking at the history of governments. But I usually don't emphasize that because then people think that I'm crazy or something. Um, but anyway, I mean, that's, that's basically why I think you should be allowed to have the machine gun and the Barrett 50 caliber and whatever, uh, because the government has those things and we should have the same things that they have. Um, okay, other, other things I wanted to say. Um, so there, they're just disputes about all the empirical literature. So, I mean, I read some of this literature and there are people who are very pro-gun and people who are very anti-gun. Uh, and so, like, whenever I hear somebody kind of pronounce on what the empirical conclusion is, uh, I can just sort of tell whether they're pro-gun or anti-gun. I mean, uh, if, if you didn't have an opinion to begin with and you read this literature, I mean, I, I think you'd probably conclude that it's really hard to tell whether private gun ownership is beneficial or not. Uh, I, I cited this, or referred to this National Research Council study. Now, so I'm not a social scientist, but I took them to be pretty credible. They're nonpartisan. But, and they, they basically conclude that, well, we, we can't really tell, so that we can't really tell whether these shell issue laws are overall beneficial or harmful. Uh, and, you know, you'll get different people giving different conclusions. Um, uh, I guess, you know, apropos of, um, Gary Kleck's estimates of self-defense uses of guns. Um, the, I, I don't know how many of the self-defense uses were legitimate. 
So uh, it's, it's sort of like hard, it's hard to tell. Uh, it's possible that some of the self-defense uses were illegal but still morally justified. Um, I suspect that many of the self-defense users are actually themselves criminals, defending themselves against other criminals. Uh, actually, most crimes are committed by criminals against other criminals. Uh, the fact that you're a criminal, though, doesn't mean you don't have the right to defend yourself. So, um, and okay, well, um, on the subject of sort of when you can outweigh an individual's rights to produce better consequences. So I'm obviously not going to give uh, the answer to that. Like how many lives do you have to save for it to be justified to kill one innocent person? I'm not gonna give the number and that's the answer to that. But uh, I'm gonna say like it's gotta be fairly high. So, and you don't have to give the answer to that in order to judge every practical question, right? Uh, because it could be that the like, you just know that you're not close to the threshold, right? So I think we're just not anywhere close to the threshold. Like, if preventing people from owning guns is really comparable to the government actually committing crimes, uh, I think we're just nowhere close. Would, I mean, if you think that it has to be, you know, saving 100 times more, like you have to save 100 lives in order to take one life, well, I mean, we're not in anywhere close to that. The government is saving 100 times as many people, right? Um, Okay, what else do I want to say? Um, you know, when, when I did research on this several years ago, like what I read about self-defense was that um, a gun was basically the only effective means of self-defense. Um, and I, I guess I should be cautious about contradicting the social scientist sitting next to me when I'm not one. But uh, anyway, that's, that's what I heard from the National Self-Defense, wait, sorry, the National Crime Victimization Survey. Um, and it also kind of made sense to me, like, um, if you decide to try to punch the criminal, then it makes sense that he would then just beat the crap out of you. But if you pull a gun, I don't think that, like, there's not very many people who would decide to still attack you. Like, they would probably run away, right? And you would probably not have to actually shoot them. But, okay, that's all. I just, I just want to, um clarify something. So uh, Dr. Humer, I think, sort of um, vaguely inferred that I might be anti-gun because I um, am promoting reasonable gun policy. I just want to state very, very clearly, I personally am a gun owner and I have a concealed carry permit. I 100% support an individual's right to keep and bear arms. So just didn't want that to get missed in the fray. Not anti-gun. Okay, thank you all. Now we're going to start our question and answer period. Um, there are going to be pe people walking around with microphones, um, so if you can let them know that you would like a chance to talk. I just want to say that, um, I'll ask the first question, I guess, I, but I just want to say that um, when you ask these questions, we're giving you an opportunity to inquire of these speakers not to make a speech yourself, right? And we'd like, in keeping with the spirit of this uh, event, for your questions to be civil and brief. So. My question briefly for uh, Professor Kapasi is, are you carrying now? No, because Vermont is a permitless state, uh, so you actually don't need a permit to carry, but I'm not uh, allowed to carry in Vermont. Okay, just checking. <laughs> and I wanted to ask Mike um, also, um, you, in your presentation you talked a lot about um, taking guns away from people, but you didn't talk about the other sorts of restrictions on guns. So I'm wondering where you come out on that, for example, um, requiring people to get a permit or waiting periods or that sort of thing. Thanks. Yep. Um, so you have to sort of, uh, you have to think about each particular law and also think about in relation to what the purpose is of the right to bear arms. So uh, um, there's one thing, I don't want the government to have a record of who owns guns. And that's partly because I think this protection against the government itself is a legitimate function. Uh, if the government has a list of everyone who owns guns, then you know before they get to the point where they would be tyrannical enough that you would need to use the guns, before that, there would come the point where they would take the guns away from all the people who are on that list. Right. Okay, well, that's all the answer I'm gonna get, apparently. Um, 
let's let's see some questions. Yeah, go for it. Hello. Okay, so I I'm also a social scientist, and uh, you know I'm worried about going up against a philosopher, but. Um, I guess my question is, you framed your, your cases very narrowly, and do you think that if a citizen who wants to use a gun in self-defense, is it can we make them aware that there are a lot of potential harms to themselves from having that gun, that it's increasing the risk of suicide from someone in the home, or this gun could be taken away and used against you in a crime, or uh, unintentional shootings, I and mean, we hear about these stories as well, I don't think people are super well informed about um, how likely it is that they're going to be able to de defend themselves because we see those amazing scenes in the movies and it looks so easy. Okay, good question. Well, so uh, the suicide thing I think is a real risk, but only for certain people. So that is, I think that you can know if you are or are not at risk of suicide. Like, so I know that I'm not going to commit suicide. Like, I know that for sure. <laughs> and if I get a gun, it's still not going to happen. OK, but um, the other things I think are sort of uh, blown out of proportion risks. So the rate of accidental death with firearms is very low, actually. So uh, yeah, so uh, she said a few hundred a year. Uh, swimming pools are way more dangerous. Um, yeah, I mean. We're coming it, after them next. Yeah, uh, it's, t it's totally. A, totally cool to inform people. Like, we could go on a kind of, like, media campaign. Uh, the government could even do this, you know. Um, but, but I think it's, like, just the gun safety isn't that big of a problem. Um, the gun being taken away from you and then used against you, I think that's also extremely unlikely. Um, if you have a gun and it's sort of like it's not secure, there's a chance of it being stolen. But it's probably not going to be used against you. I mean, like somebody might steal it and then just you never see see it again, um, right? But I mean, um, I I think some of the impression of how ineffective guns are is based upon um, it's based upon statistics about how often you kill somebody else to in defending yourself versus how often you get killed. But like the the benefit of having a gun for self defense is not that you might kill somebody, like um, and most of the time to defend yourself you don't have to kill anybody, right? So actually, like according to Gary Kleck, you know something like one percent of the time would you actually have to shoot the gun? Because like if you pull if you pull out a, out a gun and somebody's trying to commit a crime, they will probably leave, and then and then there will probably not be any statistics about that, right? But I mean, uh, you know, like imagine you're a criminal, and what the criminal wants is he wants your money or something like that. And then, you know, so your criminal, your intended victim turns out to have a gun, and what do you do? Like, you just run away and find another victim or something. That, well, two things. One thing that has to be addressed is the arms race aspect of guns. Um, I think we can make a good argument that a society would be better off if nobody had guns, including, for that matter, the police, the way the British police used to operate until fairly recently. That's not American society. It's not even British society anymore. And so once guns en enter into a market, then it can be very rational to believe if they have guns, I want a gun. And the they can be the police, it can be the military, it can be criminals who can quite easily get guns, it can be you know, any array of people. And the logic of arms races is that there's often no stopping point. And you know, we could get into discussions of, well, what about machine guns or what about whatever? And I'm sure I would draw the line short of where you would draw the line, but you know, it's still the same kind of point that they now have fill in the blank with whatever today's bell and whistle weapon is, and so I want to buy that, and so that will lead, you know, the enemy, whoever the enemy might be, to say, well, we have to escalate as well. The other point I want to make with regard to your question, as I indicated before, I don't like the fact that UT 
allows guns on campus, but I'm not really worried by it. I really do view it as, as I said before, simply part of the culture war, and I'm not worried. What I do think is truly problematic is the Texas policy, along with 44 other states, incidentally, that I expect is, might be more robust in Texas than in some other states, of open carry. Because, I mean, I can understand the argument for open carry. Um, we're kind of assuming with self-defense that it's Martha Stewart in her home. But what about taking your gun with you everywhere at all time and displaying it? That's a different world. And just think for a moment of the common narrative of practically every single one of the episodes over the last several years, particularly with young black men, but not only young black men, who are killed by the police. And the police story is, I thought he had a gun. And on some number of occasions, he does have a gun. And that is one reason why basically nobody has been tried for what some people would regard as murder, others might regard as manslaughter, others would simply settle for this is really unfortunate in terms of American society at this time. So if everybody is caring openly, as against being concealed, but if you see people caring openly, then one of the things you really have to do is engage in kind of quick thinking about the context, is it an alley at night, is it a bar, is it again fill in the blank, what does this person look like, which invites, to put it mildly, all sorts of invidious stereotyping, and if you're caring and you see that person caring, then like the cop who somewhat reasonably says I was in fear for my life because I saw the gun, and let's assume for the moment that there was a gun. Uh, one can't be entirely unsympathetic, or maybe one can't be unsympathetic at all to the police officer who shot quickly rather than taking the chance of being shot by the person he thought correctly had a gun. Um, that I see, frankly, um, as far, far scarier than concealed weapons. I mean, I look into a classroom, I have no idea who's caring, and as I've already said, I'm not really concerned. If some student wants to go after me, I don't think that person is gonna take the trouble to get a legal permit to carry. Um, you know, I, I would have other things to worry about than the fact that a University of Texas law student with a permit would simply get so outraged about my views on presidential power or whatever uh, to pull out a gun. But open carry, I think, really raises all sorts of problems um, that are insufficiently addressed. Okay, let's take another question. Rick, you had somebody over here? Yep. Hi. Um, so I, my name's Sarah, I'm a gender studies major here at the university. And I was wondering, um, seeing as a lot of these crimes, I think it's in our masculinities class, it's 31 of major school shootings since 1999 have been perpetrated by men. What role does uh, hegemonic masculinity play in educating um, about gun ownership? Uh, I guess I'll comment on that. Um, so. Uh, almost all violent crimes are committed by men. Uh, also, almost all the victims are men. I think something like 80% of murder victims are men and 90% of the killers are men, or something like that. Um, by the way, uh, I, um, as an aside, it's not because of our culture. It's because of our genes, right? Because this is like cross-cultural, actually, like uh, all over the world, men like to kill other men. <laughs> Uh, historically, usually it's killing somebody in the other tribes. Uh, you know, in primitive tribes, the men would go and raid the neighboring tribe to kill a bunch of men. Uh, by the way, in, in case you want to know the reason for that, the, re the um, evolutionary explanation is that they would kill the men and then they would steal the women. And then, as a result of having done that, they would have more offspring. And therefore, there would be more copies of their genes in the next generation. <laughs> right? 
that's why. Okay, and, uh, and the mechanism for this is this thing called testosterone. So what are we gonna do about this? Uh, I don't know, right? Like, uh, I mean, be, because it, it has a biological basis, it's harder to deal with than if it were that we're just teaching people. But uh, what do you do about it? I don't know. Um, you know, maybe, you know, maybe just what we're already doing. You know, like you, you know, you try try to punish people if they commit violence, um, and and you have, um, you know, you try to have it so that the person who's thinking of committing violence is aware that they will be met with force in turn. They won't just get away with it. I mean, your question is really fascinating one because let me go back to Martha Stewart for a moment, and and a variety of the federal laws that restrict gun ownership that Anthony Scalia had no problems with and are not legally problematic in terms of current American law, they're all based on some mixture of evidence and stereotype. That is, if somebody has been convicted of a felony, that person is more likely to be dangerous than somebody who's not been convicted of a felony. There's a huge debate after every mass killing, usually in this country, the mass killings are done by people we quickly define as mentally ill, uh, rather say than politically motivated terroristic mass killings, which require different analysis. So there's a huge debate about should the mentally ill, and how do you define mentally ill? Well, one way of doing that is people who have been incarcerated at one point or another, voluntarily or involuntarily, or people who have simply sought voluntary treatment with a therapist for their um, you know, difficulties in self-control or, or whatever. And we kind of accept those arguments, that mixture of evidence and stereotype. But what you're pointing out is that there's a great deal of evidence that violence is gender-linked, and so would it be reasonable to say that women should have an easier time buying guns than men? The answer is yes. The pro it would be easy to say that. And I, one could make good arguments as to why that ought to be social policy. The problem you would run into immediately is that lawyers would immediately litigate and say this is the invidious use of gender stereotypes and under the 14th Amendment, um, gender is a suspect classification or you know, we won't go into the legal mumbo jumbo, but you have to present an exceedingly persuasive justification for the use of gender as a classification and what would it take to persuade a judiciary very likely to be made up of males that it's an exceedingly persuasive justification to say that I should have a greater set of hurdles to run than you should have in buying guns. I think it's a perfectly sensible argument, but I would not take this case on a contingent fee. <laughs> so, so there are, there's at least one state, if not two, that uh, for women who have been victims of domestic violence for which their partners are under a domestic violence restraining order, sort of shortening the period that it takes to get firearms so they can more quickly have a firearm to defend themselves. So I don't know, we'll see what happens uh, if, if it gets litigated or not, but there are some states that are trying to push that social policy forward, specifically for women who are you know, leaving a violent relationship and their partners have a domestic violence restraining order. Okay, we Sorry, uh, I wanted to make another comment. Uh, okay, I'll, I'll make another, uh, you know, politically incorrect comment. Um, That's why we uh, invited you. Uh, the, other, the other solution to male violence is the men need to get married. That is, uh, your chance of committing violence goes way down if you get married. And uh, that is also in line with the evolutionary explanation. <laughs> All right. Okay, um, we've got some questions on this side. Yeah, please, you can direct it at one of the participants if you want. Hi, professors. Well... You were saying government own machine guns, so people should own machine guns. So my question is that we will say the white supremacists should own this, uh, machine guns in order to secure their radical ideology. Is it legitimate? <laughs> uh, let's see. Uh, do, so I guess the question is sort of, do white supremacists have a right to own machine guns? 
I guess yes, until they commit an actual violent crime. Uh, do they have a good reason for owning it? Probably not. Uh, do they have the right to actually use the machine guns, you know, to shoot people? No, obviously not, right? Um, I mean, uh, sort of, you know, in, in America, you have the right to do stuff, you know, all sorts of stuff that you don't have a good reason to do until you've done something seriously wrong, like until you violate somebody else's rights and it's proven. And so, you know, you can go around having like really horrible ideologies and really horrible reasons for why you want to own guns or whatever. And, uh, and the government should just leave you alone until you actually commit a crime. Yeah, I'm more inclined to regulate machine guns and, and other weapons because under either of the, what I regard as the two standard justifications, of private possession of firearms, that is resistance against a tyrannical state or self-defense. Um, one does not want the claimant of the right to be able to become a tyrant him or herself. Um, and so if you have a private person with a super duper machine gun, or we can now start talking about bazookas and atomic weapons or a private air force, then if your objection is to the possibility of state tyranny, I also strongly object to the possibility of private tyranny. Um, now there's one other argument, which is more of an empirical argument, that one of the remarkable truths of not only post-World War II world, but even post-1985 world, is that super duper weapons are not really all that important, all that effective. Uh, nuclear weapons haven't been used, so they're you know kind of a null set. But the Soviet Union, which I remember very well, most of you literally don't remember at all, and the Soviet, wep Soviet Union certainly had not only atomic weapons, but lots and lots of other weapons, and for whatever reason, they didn't matter. There were pink revolutions, there were uh, orange revolutions, et cetera. It turns out that in Northern Ireland, in Israel or Palestine, or in a whole variety of places around the world, you can generate significant, call it what you will, disruption, liberation movements, or whatever, with quite low levels of weaponry, beginning with rocks. Um, but there's a reason that much of the debate is about handguns or rifles. Um, so even if you're concerned about people having the ability to rise up against tyrannical regimes, or if you're concerned about individuals having the ability to effectively protect themselves against other individuals who don't wish them well, it's not at all clear that you need more than relatively low level weaponry to do it. And the more high level the weaponry is, the more I think there is justified reason to be afraid of its misuse. And at that point, for the, to allow the state to intervene on grounds of sound social policy. I guess just uh, another comment, like if you're, if you're worried about criminals, really it's like handguns that you should be worried about. You really shouldn't be worried about machine guns and uh, assault rifles and whatever. Um, you, you can get military rifles like all over the country, but they're just very rarely used in crime, right? And so like, and, and the reason why people are wanting these is because they're like gun enthusiasts and they think it's cool, right? But, okay. Which to me is a legitimate reason. <laughs> okay, we're gonna go for a couple more questions. We're, we're about to run out of time, but we're gonna go a little longer because we started a little bit late. So we've got one in the back here. Hello, professors. Um, it seems to me that when it comes to uh, guns and gun laws, a lot of people can be uninformed, particularly when it's on a state-by-state -state basis. Do any of you think there's any worth to public education in particular, um, making uh, gun education mandatory from the use to the history of the gun uh, in a similar way to the, how they make CPR education mandatory? Yeah, except that, frankly, as with almost everything else in public education these days, it you know, think of sex education, think of American history, there would very quickly be contention over what you should teach about the history of the gun. Uh, there's a wonderful book, 
uh, called Gun, uh, Gunfight by Adam Winkler um, at UCLA. And one of the things he points out is that Dodge City and other cities of the Old West had gun control laws. The shootout at the OK Corral was, in fact, because the Clanton gang were violating the gun control laws in that Arizona city at the time. So you can't look at American history and find some Edenic situation where everybody was allowed to engage in open carry everywhere because that's just what it meant to be an American. But I assure you that the NRA would object to this teaching of the history of American gun laws. But you know, in principle, I think your question is a very good question. Okay, what, we've got time for two more questions um, before we start our reception, then we can talk a little bit more. Got one back here, Ellen. Yeah, hi, um, I have two questions. I'll link them quickly. We have um, time for three more questions. Okay, uh, this first one is to Professor Kofasi. Do I have the name right? Um, I'm actually curious about where you get your funding to do this work, because in 1996, Congress passed a law that prohibits the federal use of funds for any research that, quote, promotes gun control, which essentially killed federal funding for public health research into gun violence. So I'm just I'm a little intrigued by that. Uh, and then my second question is for uh, Professor Humer. Um, and as I understand your argument, what you're basically saying is, um, Maybe, perhaps, it could be okay for the government to regulate private ownership of guns if enough violence was caused by private ownership of guns. But I also hear you say, so, so that's like an empirical question. Like that resolves on how much gain to how much violence. But I also heard you say that you basically have rejected all of the empirical s studies of this. So I'm not sure how you can have an argument that is based on an empirical premise where you reject all the ways to get to the empirical answer. Uh, so um, just to clarify, the Dickey Amendment did not technically prohibit the federal government. It said you know, no money could be used in whole or in part uh, to advocate for gun policy. Uh, the CDC's budget was then cut by exactly how much money was spent on firearms research. And just a couple years prior, Kellerman and colleagues had published their land-breaking studies showing that household-level gun ownership increased risk of homicide by three to five times, and then they lost $2.5 million. And so it basically was interpreted as, as a ban, and not just the CDC, it sort of infiltrated throughout the rest of the national institutes. Um, that doesn't count for the National Institute of Justice, the Bureau of Justice Assistance, sort of law enforcement-focused things, which is a lot of the work I do with the Baltimore Police Department. We also have some very generous private foundations that are willing to fund the evaluations of different policies. They sometimes don't like the findings because we tell them that gun laws don't work. Um, and you know, we're not just for gun laws because of the sake of gun laws. We wanna show what works and what doesn't. And we're sort of raining on their parade right now about comprehensive background checks. Um, but so yeah, that's generally where we get our funding. Mike. Uh, okay. Um, uh, I'm, not, I'm not sure what you meant by re reject all of the empirical studies. I think what I said was that um, the empirical evidence is mixed and there's no general consensus uh, with the conclusion that we don't know um, how much benefit or how much harm is caused by gun control laws. Uh, and imagine that somebody wants to violate one person's rights and their justification is they think that it might produce a greater benefit, but actually we don't know and actually it might be producing greater harm for other people instead of the benefit, then is it okay? Well then generally no, right? Like you have to be pretty sure that it's gonna produce a much greater benefit, right? Uh, and you know, in, so in this case, we're not sure of that. Okay, we're gonna take one more question. Um, at the end of this question, Rick's gonna come back up and say another couple of words, I guess. And um, then we have a reception outside here. We hope you all can attend it. But please stick around as soon as this question's answered um, for Rick's uh, final word. Um, Hi, you, is this on? Yeah. My name is Nick. I'm a sophomore here at UVM. My question is, there's an argument 
that in a good way to prevent gun violence is to raise the prices of ammunition to exuberant prices. For example, $20 a bullet. And that if you were to do something like this, people, there would be much less, say, drive-by shootings, and people who would buy the bullets would be people who do it for fun, like hunting and game sports. So what do you think about this? Do you think raising the prices of ammunition would prevent gun violence, suicide, homicide? Uh, yeah, do, doesn't that seem ridiculous? I mean, um, the, the people who are using large amounts of ammunition are like shooting enthusiasts, like people who go down to the range and just go target shooting for hours or something like that. So it's really them that would be targeted. If you're a murderer, you don't need that many bullets. So if it was like $20 a bullet, big deal, right? Uh, so, so, but it would just be a huge uh, burden for like the firearm enthusiasts. Yeah, I, I totally agree. Like we'll go to the range and burn through several hundred rounds of ammunition. I would not do that if I had to pay $20 a bullet and that would just totally ruin all of my fun. So, and I don't think it would, there, there is much like there are tons and tons of guns out in civilian hands, there's already tons and tons of ammunition. So it would, it would be detrimental to folks like me who like to shoot for sport, but there'd become an underground market for ammunition being sold by the folks who have stockpiled ammunition, much like there's an underground gun market for guns. So I don't, I don't think it would be effective. Okay, Rick's gonna say a word and then we'll uh, retire. Well, thank you very much everybody for coming. This is great. We wanna thank the panelists. We have a little gift from Vermont for each of our One more thing, if you didn't get a chance to get your question answered, then you know, seek out the uh, speakers during the reception. I do, there's some nice food out there and uh, thanks very much for coming, this is great. Thank you very much.